Uh, welcome everyone to this workshop. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, decentralized or decent alternatives for interacting with citizens. And I already say decentralized out of uh, automatism because uh, that's roughly the, the topic that we will be dealing with today. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we have two practitioners of decentralized um, social media in public institutions. Uh, who will be telling us about that and the bigger picture of this. Uh, so we have Jana Höfner, the head of my communications from the German state ministry, of, uh, the German state Baden-Württemberg, and Marcel Kolaja, member and vice president of the European Parliament. Um, so we'll be giving them plenty of time to talk about their um, respective experiences and thoughts uh, on this topic. Um, I'll start with an introduction on what is the topic, what is the problem that we're trying to solve, and what direction are we looking for the solutions. Um, and yeah, um, we're ready, let's go. Oh yeah, a few practical notes. Um, this session is being recorded. Um, so if you want to stay off the record, then don't request permission to turn on the camera. Um, do feel free to uh, ask for permission to turn on camera if you do want to ask a question or ask a question in the chat in the bottom in the, on the right. Um, so we are not with many people, I think, or small audience, so we can really make it easy and casual and uh, feel free to ask questions during the talk, um, during the talks. And, um, yeah, the slides are available. Can you, you can possibly see the URL already. I just put it on a temporary place. I will put it online afterwards as well. Um, let me just copy this into the chat for people in case it's too small. Oh, so in case my slides are too small to read on the screen share, for example, you can just copy the URL from the chat and um, Flip it through it there. Um, or if you're too impatient to wait, then uh, wait wrong time. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'll start with an introduction uh, of the topic and then uh, give the uh, mic to the next. Um, so, we're a bit late, so I'm going to rush through it a little, I guess. Uh, in general, it's quite good. So, I'll start with talking about problem in the left slides, and then on the right, a bit about uh, solutions and um, yeah, first, the obvious problem that we're talking about, we're talking about social media, which if you have read the news in the last few years, uh, there have been a couple of uh, complaints about social media destroying democracy or invading people's privacy or those kind of things. Um, and then we're talking mainly about things like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Twitter YouTube, like the, um, as people call it, surveillance-based uh, social media platforms. So, Let's not go into uh, the details of all these problems. Um, if you want to get a good dramatic introduction, you can watch the new uh, Netflix documentary, uh, social, The Social Dilemma, um, but also um, I think uh, this New York, Times art, New York Times article from two years ago it gives a good overview as well um, and uh, it goes in the same direction as this talk, I think, in terms of solutions, so, so I recommend it. But the dilemma we're going to talk about here is um, more specifically about public institutions on social media. So a lot of public institutions are on uh, platforms like Facebook to interact with their citizens, or they, they tell people to follow them on Twitter, contact them through WhatsApp. And uh, we thought that for, um, for a public institution, that's a, a, bit, a bit weird to use such problematic platforms, but uh, the, the, the reality that we see is that you can hardly get around it if you want to reach citizens and uh, a lot of institutions feel compelled to use these platforms. Even um, people who want to get into the parliament to prohibit Facebook will use Facebook to get votes. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's really hard. Uh, so the dilemma is right, more, more or less that you can either reach your citizens or respect their privacy and uh, uh, yeah their freedom to not accept the terms of service of these platforms. So here you see the reality. Of, um, I, I just got a few screenshots. Um, this is from a slide from um, the EDPS, the European Data Protection Supervisor. 
um, the amount of Twitter profiles, hundreds of Twitter profiles, Facebook profiles, YouTube profiles of um, European institution members, um, including individuals, I think, or, or just the institutions as a whole. So here, uh, some, from some front pages of institution websites, uh, I chose uh, data protection authorities and the uh, European Fundamental Rights Agency. They, they will tell you, oh, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. Um, uh, because this event was hosted in Amsterdam, I thought, uh, at the to Amsterdam. Uh, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you, everything. Um, you can also often get a newsletter, and a few of them also do have an RSS feed, so you can follow it in whichever application you want. But often they don't get the same content that you get, not the real-time updates that you get from their Twitter feed, for example. So, um, so it, it's not just for social media, and you see the same with apps, for example. Like you can get an uh, an app from an EU institution on iTunes or on Google Play, but not somewhere else. They don't just offer you a download button to get it directly from the institution itself. Like you're forced to go through these uh, mega platforms. Um, I, just, I thought I'll highlight a, 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 a nice exception. Um, well, the EDPB on the right, um, they just have RSS. You can also print things. If you want to share an article, you just print it. Um, and on the left, I don't know if anyone in the audience here speaks uh, Czech, uh, no, uh, Croatian, uh, but I thought, oh, oh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, I've got another uh, site like that. But no, actually, if you translate text, it supposedly says, click here to get tips on how to remove your information from these platforms. I think that is uh, a good justifiable reason to name these platforms on your website as, as a data protection authority. So a big um, a big remark, like an important remark of, of course that, that can be made here is that the platforms are to blame. Like if, if, if Facebook is uh, not respecting people's privacy, we should complain to about Facebook, we should give them fines, we should make them change. It's like, why are we, uh, but uh, who, who's, what role does the institution have in this, for example? But um, it's a bit like when, when, as an institution, you choose which printer to use for uh, making your booklets or you're, you're printing your reports. Like if, if those are, known to not be up to your uh, ethical standards or possibly legal standards, then you, you ought to choose another one, right? But of course, the problem is you can't reach them uh, if all the people are at one platform. But yeah, so there's um, this dilemma. Um, and in an interesting court case uh, two years ago, um, the Court of Justice of the European Union um, that in the in the Wirtschaftsakademie case, that both the um, the organization that had a fan page on Facebook, as well as Facebook itself, they both shared the responsibility uh, of uh, treating people's data uh, properly. And the Wirtschaftsakademie couldn't just blame Facebook for the data processing done by Facebook uh, on on behalf of the Wirtschaftsakademie. So uh, this is interesting. I don't know the legal details well enough to really uh, go into this, but also we don't want to because we want to go to solutions. So something that has been uh, growing in, in the last few years, and also it, it's an idea as much older, of course, but it's to try to decentralize social media. So replace the platform with a network, a federated network where different social media can interact with each other. So if one uh, party, uh, if an organization decides to be on, on, on uh, not on Facebook, but somewhere else, people that are on Facebook would possibly still follow them, or, or they wouldn't use Facebook, it's something else. So you have a free choice of which provider you have, and which application you use, just like you have with, for example, email. And you can choose which provider you have, which, and you can contact people that use another provider. Easy as that. Um, so Mastodon is one of the most uh, popular um, Platforms, or well, platform is not the right word, uh, social networks uh, in this direction. Um, it it uh, started uh, I think a couple of years ago already, but it really got traction since um, the World Wide Web Consortium standardized the protocol together, like Mastodon and several other software projects work together to make. Um, 
a, a protocol called ActivityPub. And this made that people that are on a Mastodon server can also interoperate, can also discuss with people that are on a different platform. Um, so someone can be on a friendly card, Pleroma, PeerTube, a Pixel Thread, like different types of softwares, and they can all interact with each other. Anyone can start a new type of software. And um, yeah, so this, this creates what is called the Fediverse, the federated universe of um, softwares. And here is an overview, it's maybe a bit too small, um, but it's a timeline of different softwares when, they, when these projects were started. Uh, in different categories like video streaming, audio streaming, microblogging, like there's a lot of course microblogging, the Twitter inspired uh, softwares. Um, but um, you'll yeah, you'll see here um, on the on the right, everything has this yellow glow behind it, and those are all the activity pub based things. So a couple of years ago, there were many different softwares that uh, talk different protocols, and they couldn't always interact with each other. And more and more. People start using the same protocol, so there's kind of this standard emerging uh, on how to interact with each other. Uh, and just to give one example of um, like different things, it doesn't have to look like Twitter or like like Mastodon looks a lot like Twitter, but PeerTube is a great example, which looks much more uh, like YouTube, and it allows people to upload videos and share videos with each other, and it, people can be on different YouTube instances and still talk to each other. So. Um, that's that's the, um, the, oh, the ways these things can go with much uh, variety. One ideal kind of uh, could of course be to say like, well, why don't Twitter and Facebook and other and YouTube, why, why don't they just support these protocols and become instances in this big, big federated network? Um, but I guess commercial interests are one problem in it. Um, and of course, like, um, yeah. Um, it's also not so easy to switch from one thing to another. Um, but yeah, that's it, one idea that you can imagine. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, the speaker's thoughts on uh, whether that's something to strive for and whether it's not what I want at all. Um, yeah, that if yeah, such a, a situation could solve the dilemma of reaching and respecting your audience. So, but a first step that people could already uh, do is to at least start also publishing on a decentralized platform. Like if an institution has a Twitter account or a Facebook account, and I would like to follow their updates, like it would be nice if the same content is also available on, for example, Mastodon or another, uh, or another technology neutral uh, feed or vendor neutral, provider neutral. So uh, it would also help with, for example, uh, the GDPR compliance of, of your Organization uh, and it would, like allow people to it would give an incentive to move away from uh, platforms like Facebook to Google. So interesting. Um, uh, some interesting uh, recommendation I found was the social media guidelines of the Data Protection Authority of Van Muttenberg, which um, literally says that access to information from the public body must not depend on prior registration with a social network. The information provided on any social media platform must as always be available by alternative means. And it might be the same for interactivity. If you want to comment on something, uh, if you want to uh, reply to a, a tweet, like you shouldn't have to be on Twitter to uh, connect to the institution. And perhaps not coincidentally, uh, the Ministry of Baden-Württemberg is one of the first, or perhaps the first that I know of, um, like institution with an official Mastodon account. And um, I'm super happy that we have here, with us here Jana Höpner, the head of online communications from um, the State Ministry of Baden-Württemberg, to tell us more about her experience and the the why and how uh, the ministry there is doing this. So please, Jana, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. I hope you can hear me all. Okay, wonderful. I have some technical issues here uh, and my iPad is somewhat challenged. 
So um, I am here to talk about our master presence in uh, quick. Um, I will talk about why we are Mastodon, what are the upsides and what the downsides and how we use Mastodon. Um, why we are Mastodon to start uh, is data protection. We had a dispute with our data protection officer, Dr. Stefan Brink, uh, for our use of Facebook and Twitter. He's not very happy with this, that we are using Facebook and Twitter due to data protection issues, but we are um, dependent of using that networks. Um, maybe I can say something about th this point later. We are always trying out new ways to communicate, communicate with uh, the public. And we had a Mastodon account several years ago, but uh, we uh, disposed to get, get rid of it because there were no one on the Mastodon at this time. And I guess we had uh, about 10 followers. Um, and also we want to reach more people and other audiences that we wouldn't reach about our classic website or our uh, classic um, social media channels. So what are the upsides for us? It's a new channel. Um, Baden-Württemberg is a pioneer in Mastodon or on Mastodon. We also have our icon on our website, as you have shown. Um, it's a kind of an experimental field, so we can communicate in other ways than on Twitter or Facebook, because it's not so public as the other networks, so we can be more um, yeah, direct in, in our uh, speech. Um, it's a decentralized infrastructure, that's one up point, and you have 500 characters instead of 280 characters, which is, as when you make political communication, very fine if you have to um, write about some lawmaking process and very long German words about laws, um, then 500 char characters are much better than 280 characters. But there are many downsides as well for us on Mastodon. It's an extra administration effort for us. We have to um, take care about Mastodon because it doesn't work with our social media tools. So we can't integrate it, them in our workflows. So um, we have to do everything parallel and have um, uh, and uh, moderation of the channel, which is not very much, but we have to do it uh, on Mastodon directly and we don't have a ticket system like for other channels. Um, the limited video usability is a problem. You can only upload, I guess, 35 megabytes of video. So the videos are either very short or very um, bricked um, with a bad quality. quality. Uh, the usability of Mastodon is, in my opinion, not very good. Uh, not as good as on uh, Twitter or other networks. Um, and it's a kind of a nerdyverse, um, I like to say. There are, maybe it's a downside, maybe it's an upside, but there are very much discussions that go over, over our heads. They want to talk with us about servers and IPs and what not, and we are not technicians, we are <laughs> editors. Um, so um, the discussion goes over our head sometimes. Um, to put it in perspective, um, other networks outrange Mastodon by far. For September, uh, for instance, we had uh, 12,000 link, 12, link clicks from uh, Facebook, from Twitter, 1,500, and only 128 link clicks on Mastodon. Um, yes, um, one Insta story in five hours nearly got a thousand uh, link clicks and um, the new hot thing on the net is the messenger, um, which uh, generates far more clicks than all other networks together with around 112,000 clicks and our classic newsletter is around 100,000 clicks in September. Um, how do we use Mastodon? Mostly we use it parallel to Twitter. We have no automation whatsoever. So um, there is uh, one employee that copy pastes the tweet into the Mastodon um, uh, browser and change the tracking ID so we can see how often a link is clicked. Um, and we uh, usually use it to answer questions of users. So we 
are very dialogue driven in our um, communication efforts also on the other networks so uh, especially during corona crisis we have on, uh, answered around 100,000 questions uh, with our team around about yeah about corona um, restrictions and uh, we see social media as it is as a social media not only to communicate our standpoint also to discuss um, and to answer questions of the public so that's the main use of uh, mastodon how we use it and um, i think we're pretty uh, successful with our account we have now 818 followers um, which is I guess nearly everyone who has mastered on in Germany, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe there are some more, but <laughs> um, I don't think there is much more um, head above to to uh, grow on Mastodon. Um, yes, um, I started that we had a dispute with a data protection officer, Dr. Stefan Prink. Uh, for our use of Facebook and Twitter, he doesn't want us to use these networks because of data protection and uh, user protection. And we need to use these networks, I said. And that was clear, um, especially during Corona crisis. As I just said, we are answered 100,000 questions and got many more questions and uh, comments on our channels. And if we don't add Facebook and Twitter in this time, we were not able to communicate um, the restrictions of Corona to the people um, out in our country. Um, we also used our website, we used the newsletter, we used, used Messenger, we used newspapers as well. Um, but as we know, um, there are many people who only get information from Facebook or Twitter or uh, other online media. So it was very important to communicate our, our point of view or our restrictions and also answer the questions of the people because if you have a six page law that um, rules everyday life, you get questions over questions because there are so many special cases. Um, and that would not happen on Mastodon at all. Yeah. Well, thanks. That's uh, great to hear how in practice you use this and what also nice that you share us the, um, the issues with Mastodon. I think it is uh, indeed, uh, I may sound very um, uh, opinionated about we should move this direction, of course, but it's it's totally clear that these things are experimental and this is, is it's, I understand that there's Lots of um, things that could be improved. Um, so I think I'll directly uh, pass the mic on to Marcel. Would you like to tell more about how you are using decentralized social media, but also uh, in general your view on what could the European Parliament do? What could institutions in, uh, in general do? What do we need legislation? What is already there? What's the view from the parliament? Okay, thanks. Um, sure, um, with pleasure. I um, I would like to address before I begin uh, one of the points that has been raised, which is um, eight hundred followers uh, is uh, kind of like the um, uh, the top that uh, we can get in in, in Germany. I just uh, checked that the main developer of Mastodon has four hundred and thirty two thousand followers. So hopefully there is more room uh, to grow. And I wish you a lot of new followers on Mastodon. Uh, but now back to. Um, um, back to what institutions uh, can do for decentralization. I would like to take it from a bit, a bit um, um, broader perspective. Um, and first, you know, I start with a question: 
why are people on these centralized uh, networks like Facebook or Twitter? I would argue that the main reason not necessarily is that it's the best social network. They have the best user experience. I would argue that uh, the main reason is that, you know, there are all these interactions. There are um, these people's friends there. Uh, there are uh, those they, they want to follow. They are those that they want to be followed by. And uh, that's also the same reason why why politicians are on and institutions are on these social networks. And I think it's also their duty, uh, basically, to be there um, because we as politicians have the duty to communicate to citizens. And if citizens are on these communication channels, then we have no other choice than to be there. So I also have myself a you know Facebook page. I have a Twitter account, but in in addition to it, um, also um, I, I have a Mastodon account. And let's talk about that later, and and let's have a look on you know what uh, what the European institutions can do for decentralization. And I would split it into two uh, main categories. One is on the legislation level. Um, and it, in, in that category, um, I would like to remind that there already is something that the European Union has done in the past on um, interoperability of uh, messaging apps, uh, where in the electronic uh, communications code, uh, um, the, uh, there is given this this possibility for national regulatory authorities uh, to impose obligations um, uh, on, uh, on on providers that, in case that there is an end-to-end uh, -end connectivity endangered due to lack of interoperability, they can impose these obligations um, uh, to uh, to open for interoperability. Apparently, I would say that this concept didn't really work well because it. I would myself, um, uh, I am myself of the opinion that the messaging apps market is definitely a failure uh, because I don't know how about you, but I have like seven different um, uh, chat platforms on my phone so that I can stay in touch with people. Um, and... Uh, there is uh, also a problem of the centralization of the same with uh, with social networks. So I would say that there definitely is some space for improvement on interoperability, which we are not, uh, which we are not enforcing. Um, which leads me to another um, legislation initiative, not from the past, but from the future, or the present and the future, and that's the Digital Services Act, and. Um, that can approach it from two perspectives. One is um, um, creating more transparency on and accountability of how social networks work, including advertising, knowing how um, posts on, on your feed are prioritized, on what rule is based hiding, um, uh, hiding content or removing content. That is one. Um, uh, perspective from which the, the future Digital Services Act can approach. And, and the second is so-called ex ante rules, uh, which means um, um, basically competition-like uh, rules, uh, is similar to the telecommunication regulation for large, large platforms with signific significant market power. And uh, uh, over there, uh, there are a couple uh, options the Commission is considering. I don't think it's necessary to run into the detail. However, the point is, and, and that's what I um, I am, uh, you know, that's, that's what I pursue in, in this legislation uh, as a member of the European Parliament, uh, that those platforms that we call systemic, uh, which means they are not only a, one of the many service providers, but they basically form an infrastructure. Uh, they should uh, 
be obliged to to provide uh, API so that they are interoperable. Now, I'm not sure if I'm still, yeah, yeah, there is some move on, on the video, okay. So, um, so that is, um, that is in general what the digital services act can do in this so so to 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 explain it into maybe um engineering or a developers point of view it's basically that when you develop a decentralized social network you would have the opportunity to connect through api uh to the major platforms uh like facebook and you could become interoperable with them which means users of your platform would not have to have an account on Facebook to communicate with people on Facebook and vice versa, basically. Um, so that's that's the idea that uh, that I am pursuing uh, in in the European Parliament. I have tabled amendments to a report by the European Parliament that it, it go that direction. Um, that uh, you know, ask the Commission to impose high level of interoperability measure requiring platforms to share appropriate tools, um, um, data, expertise to limit user, user uh, lock-in or vendor lock-in. Um, the European Parliament just yesterday adopted um, the main report in the Internal Market Committee, uh, the Saliba report, uh, which, which calls for this. Uh, and um, call, asks the Commission to look into open standards. So that's definitely a good news. We are at the beginning of the legislation process. Basically, we are at the phase that the Commission is preparing uh, the proposal of the legislation. And in the meantime, the Parliament is giving guidance by producing these reports, because then uh, later in the legislation phase, it's the Parliament and the Council who have to adopt the legislation. So very, it's very important for the Commission to understand uh, where the opinion of the Parliament lies. Um, and now I would like to switch to the other category, not, not legislation, but what institutions can do um, to, um, uh, what can we can do on the institutional level in order to promote decentralized uh, open solutions more. And I would like to start with myself. Um, as I said, I have I have a Mastodon account. And that brings me back what I said in the beginning. If I compare my 4,000 followers on Twitter and my 160 on Mastodon, um, then you can imagine that if I talk to my uh, communications people, which platform they would, you know, prefer to work with because that's the biggest potential to reach citizens. And I, I cannot really blame them. Uh, but also I believe um, that it's it's very important to promote these uh, decentralized platform platforms because I, I, I truly agree with what has been said in the beginning that citizens should not be forced to agree to particular uh, terms of service in order to participate in the uh, public discussion, in the discussion what politicians, in discussion with um, um, with institutions. And that's why I co-signed also one of uh, the pilot projects in the past that calls for a Mastodon um, uh, instance run by the European Parliament uh, or run by um, European institutions in general. Unfortunately, that one hasn't uh, been adopted, but anyway, I'm pushing a, a similar direction uh, on in, in other areas anyway. Uh, for instance, um, um, and, and I said I would like to take it a bit broader, not only social networks, For in, because I, I believe that we're basically discussing the same, we're discussing decentralization. And uh, maybe you remember a, um, a communication from the Commission that recommends using uh, Signal uh, as a chat platform. And as much as I agree that it's better that many other chat platforms that uh, politicians and officials uh, might be using in, um, um, uh, currently, I also need to say that there are other uh, you know platforms that I think is are worth uh, promoting more uh, than the centralized 
platform signal, which would be matrix, for instance, where um, um, you have a federated network, uh, it can be end-to-end -end encrypted. So basically it fulfills all the criteria that are needed. Um, so um, as I said, I have, I have my own because I think we need to start from ourselves. So I have my own Mastodon account, but that's not where we end, basically. I am a, a member of the European Pirates delegation in the European Parliament. I've been a member of the Pirate Party um, uh, since 2010. And um, um, basically, this is uh, my core policy, uh, because that's very closely linked with uh, freedom on on the internet. Um, uh, that that is one that is one of my core policy, and um, uh, so so not only that I have a Mastodon account so that people can interact with me without having uh, accounts on on the major centralized platforms. Uh, we as the Pirate Party we also run our own uh, Matrix um, server for internal communication. We use Mattermost. Uh, we have a, a Nextcloud instance deployed, so you can all, you can really see that we live our values. That we are not only you know speaking to others that they should do something; we are doing it actually ourselves. Um, and uh, this is exactly the problem that European institutions are in, because it's not only uh, it's not only social networks; it's also how internally. Uh, the institutions sometimes run into an issue, like for instance, um, uh, with this uh, COVID-19 uh, times, uh, the European Parliament had to, um, you know, start working differently on remote basis, including voting. And and one of my biggest issues was when uh, some of the committees in the European Parliament. Uh, started using a voting system called iVote, which was internally developed, but is dependent on uh, Apple Cloud. And it, it, it requires members of the European Parliament, representatives of the citizens, to open an account uh, with, with Apple in order to vote, which means in order to represent their citizens. And this is something that I think is completely uh, unacceptable. Um, so what... Uh, what have I done in order that to um, uh, to change? So, so, so first of all, um, uh, I am, um, you know, I am working with other uh, colleagues of mine on um, on more general rules of, rules of procedure in the Parliament that would, uh, you know, take remote voting from a uh, uh, from a, a more general perspective and would avoid these uh, vendor lockings and these. Um, um, you know, needs to have an account somewhere in order to vote. Um, also, um, um, on, uh, for instance, um, a, a policy, internal policy of the parliament on, on cloud, uh, I also pursue this idea that, uh, that the parliament should always have a possibility to, uh, to seamlessly migrate applications uh, between cloud providers and between the different uh, types of footprint, being it public cloud, being private cloud, being a virtual uh, deployment, um, and uh, uh, I I always push for open standards, uh, open software development. Uh, there have been a couple amendments that I uh, that I signed on a so-called discharge report. Uh, where basically the parliament is giving um, uh, some uh, reflection on uh, how the institution runs, especially uh, given financial wise, where where apparently now it calls for more open standards because that's also economically beneficial for uh, for the institution. So I'm I'm really glad that this happened. Um, and uh, just yesterday, uh, I. I filed uh, in in the budget committee um, and uh, a, a pilot project that would create a Europe-wide solution for um, free and open source 
I mean, it would create a, a basically an inventory or a catalog uh, for open source solutions um, uh, used in the public institutions and an exchange platform for experience. Um, and that would, you know, help basically to share the, the good practice to avoid redundancies in the efforts and encourage other uh, institutions to use what already, uh, you know, has been uh, used by other institution. So I hope this will be very soon adopted. Uh, it's on, uh, on a really good path. And um, that's where I stop. Basically, I know I took it uh, a lot broader than only social networks, but I also believe that all these things are very much interconnected and we, we need to push on all levels uh, to push for the, the idea because we don't have decentralized social networks just because of social networks. We have it because we have this, we have this idea that we should, that the society should work like that on all levels. Exactly. Thank you so much, Marcel. I think uh, you're totally justified in taking the project, taking the problem much broader than social media, because indeed the problem is much broader. It's it's a pattern you can see in many uh, things. Um, so uh, I've been looking at the chat a bit on the side, and uh, there's a more likely discussion starting up there. Um, I thought uh, maybe an interesting question um, to ask was from Katja, who asked, "Do you think?" There is more uh, <laughs> more commission funding would be uh, would help to uh, maintain alternatives and like do, should the European Union fund uh, such projects more? Perhaps could it help um, to maybe overcome the, the problems as uh, Mark is also in the chat uh, reports like often. There are still the problems with the usability, or it doesn't work as well as, as the commercial alternatives. And it's hard to commercialize such a thing if anyone can just copy it and interact with it, and you don't have the monopoly by design. So, uh, do you think we need public funding to support this? And uh, yeah, um, I'll start with you, Marcel. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's not uh, that's not anything completely new. Um, um, my my pirate. A uh, colleague, uh, a predecessor in the European Parliament, Julia Reda, uh, from the German Pirate Party, um, she was very active uh, in in um, uh, in promoting open source, and uh, uh, she she was involved in this uh, pilot project for uh, uh, bug bounties um, on um, you know when um, um, when um, um, when the institutions, basically the idea that is behind that is when the institutions use uh, open source or there are other open source projects that are heavily, you know, used in, uh, in the society, it's, um, it, it's important to underpin innovation and cybersecurity that, um, that there is public funding on these projects that basically are of public interest. And um, I'm really happy that, you know, this was a very successful project and I'm, I'm basically working towards the same direction uh, to, to, to having some more institutionalized uh, involvement in, uh, in open source and free software projects. Maybe, Jana, what, um, I thought it was very good that you mentioned some problems that you have with for example, having to manually copy all the tweets into uh, Mustard and such. Do you think there, like, do you feel that you should get more support from, uh, for example, the DPA that tells you to uh, use this? Should, should they also help you with using the alternatives? Um, do you, um, yeah. Uh, we started our uh, Mastodon account um, uh, beginning of 2020 and then came to hit the Corona crisis and we don't have any time to think about the channel, to uh, uh, think about solutions for automated copying. There are, I know there are many accounts on Mastodon which just are clones of their Twitter accounts. 
Um, and I know there are tools for doing that. And I know there may be a possibility to integrate Mastodon in our uh, social media tool. But with um, the Corona crisis and extend workload we had for just keeping um, the system running, um, we had no time. And also right now we don't have any money left because Corona costs us a lot uh, just to keep our servers up for a classic website. So we have to wait until the next year on when, when we have some budget, budget again to talk about our agencies and our social media tool, how we can integrate Mastodon better. That's where I was muted. Uh, I'm uh, curious how this will go. And, uh, I, and, uh, it would be great to see how uh, such an experiment evolves. And I hope to see uh, maybe uh, it will become more commonplace. And it's an example. Um, would more people from the audience like to uh, pop in? I see Katya wanted to clarify her question. You're also welcome to just uh, click the button uh, request to join audio, and then I should have a button to let you speak. Um, OK, we already answered it, and that's great. Um, <laughs> Maybe, so, yeah. maybe if I can <laughs> say uh, one more thing, um, as we got on Mastodon as a uh, first official account in Germany from a, a government agency, maybe that would be a starting point for other government agencies or politicians to join Mastodon. Um, uh, we've talked to other ministries in Baden-Württemberg. If they want to join Mastodon, they are not very eager to do this, uh, I must say, um, frankly. And yeah, now we talk about it and maybe someone hears it and listens and think, okay, maybe we need uh, a Mastodon account as well for a, a government agency. I hope so. Yeah. That would, would be more. That uh, is definitely in the scope of the goals of this workshop. Um, and talking about workshop, uh, to uh, um, I mean, a one-hour workshop is too short to do anything serious. Uh, but we still thought to uh, give you some uh, homework if you uh, <laughs> if you want to get going and just we, well, we'll just add uh, some small tips. Um, uh, we. We invite everyone to create your own presence on the Fediverse to uh, create a Mastodon account or um, look at other software. So uh, join Mastodon.org uh, website. That, uh, there, there's also a nice introduction video that I didn't get around to show you. Um, and lists of different Mastodon instances and each having their di a different focus or different moderation rules. Um, or, and uh, so it helps you kind of find your way around. And then there's a great website called fediverse.party, uh, which compares different um, Fediverse projects. Uh, so, it will, um, yeah, so it tells about Mastodon, uh, but also Peertube or Pixelfed, which is kind of an Instagram clone on the Fediverse. Um, so about all these things, and it tells which other softwares they interoperate with, how big their communities are, who develops it, and uh, those kind of things. So it's a great place to start. And we are very much looking forward to, uh, as in the near future, find a toot, as they call it, a Mastodon, or uh, a message um, you can uh, um, well, um, add mention us, at, uh, for example. Um, well, I'll, I'll add our address in the chat. At re decentralize, as it goes on the Fediverse, instead of on Twitter, where you would just say at re decentralize our organization, on the Fediverse, it would be at re decentralize at mastodon.social, which is the current server we use. So, um, so, so, uh, if you uh, toot anything uh, after this workshop, after I can set up your account, and, uh, feel free to uh, uh, mention us. And then, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to see. Uh, 
how this works out. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. If, um, uh, if anyone wants to ask questions, uh, press the button join. And, um, you're welcome to join or write it in the chat. Or if Jana and Marcel have any more things you'd like to bring in. Yeah, just maybe um, uh, I wanted to say that this is a long way to go, apparently, right? It's not not not, not going to happen um, um, tomorrow. And um, so maybe my little call um, to people here uh, watching that, of course, uh, it would help us uh, who push for these ideas uh, to get some support, um, at least by maybe following us um, on, on Mastodon, um, uh, follow Baden-Württemberg, uh, follow me, you know, that conversations that we then have to have uh, with our uh, with our comms people or people who decide uh, in, you know, which time, effort, money to invest into certain communication channels is then becoming, of course, a lot easier. Um, it also helps uh, then the conversations, you know, having, uh, you know, institutionally. So that, that's one thing. Uh, well, another thing uh, which I would like to demonstrate how how you know uh, far far we are from perfect is, in order to uh, speak here, I had to register at a decent uh, at a centralized platform uh, um, that I need to admit I never um, uh, heard. Of about before but i mean that just demonstrates like like i want to speak uh, at an event about decentralization and i have to register on a centralized platform in order to do it so so th these sorry. are the <laughs> obstacles that we somehow need to uh, you know um uh, swallow <laughs> in yeah. order to um uh to to, to do something for greater good <laughs> Initially, uh, the idea was to set up our own big blue button uh, instance and uh, have it as, like, as an event outside the Hopin platform, but um, one thing at a time. <laughs> and then it's the problem again. You might lose half your audience because they have to click a link extra to, in order to get to the uh, to the outside platform. Um, I see Joost wanted to ask a question. Uh, would you like to uh, uh, speak it yourself? Uh, uh, Otherwise, I'll read it. Uh, have you seen any discussion or deliberation on the issue you mentioned of requiring a US-based commercial account, like with Apple, for governmental EU-based communication, maybe in the context of the GDPR? So, um, especially you need to, the US part may be a relevant one here. Um, and especially after the recent court case, uh, the court decision of uh, Mark Schrems. I, uh, um, I, I'm not sure. I completely understand the question, but um, uh, but if it, the question is about whether there are discussions uh, around it, then well, yeah, I am actually the initiator of these discussions because I raised the topic in uh, uh, the bureau of the European Parliament. Uh, and uh, I, um, I, I'm very much of the opinion that this is not acceptable. I called it a bad joke because I, it, you know, especially in these times when we speak about um, Europe being more sovereign in tech, depending on an American company uh, and particularly one American company, um, in a way that members of the European Parliament have to create an account in order to represent their citizens. That's nothing better than a, uh, than a bad joke for me. Yeah. Yeah. If people talk about um, like also uh, sovereignty and secure state, like national security and those kind of things, like, can those companies then also interfere with what you're doing? In the West, well, it starts complaining about Huawei being a potential threat to um, infrastructure but then uh, yeah, yeah but i also think it's you know on this very on on this very um uh, specific topic i think it's also you know fair to say that when you use um icloud or any other storage um 
in, in a proper way, which means, you know, you encrypt everything, you have some uh, safeguards for integrity, then you could still, you know, do it without the possibility of um, the, the provider to mingle into to manipulate the votes or anything like that. So I think it's still a possibility to do it correctly. But I, but, but I still need to insist that it's not acceptable that representatives of the citizens have to open an account with a particular company in order to, to, to perform their duty and their right. Exactly. And I think that's a good conclusion for this uh, workshop. Uh, see, it's exactly 11 o'clock. So I wish you thank you both for coming and, uh, and for our whole audience to uh, be involved. And so how about um, if people want to still uh, join in for a, a hallway chat, which I think is always the most important thing on conferences. Um, but, so how about we do do that on a self-hosted uh, place? So I'll, I'll type in the chat uh, URL if anyone. So next sessions are starting, so please don't let us uh, um, But let's go to meet.recentralize.org slash NGI. Uh, let me put an HTTPS before that. So uh, I put a link in the chat, meet.wecentralize.org slash NGI. Um, that should work to give us a self-hosted Jitsi room if anyone wants to talk afterwards still. Uh, I think Jana said she had to go to another meeting. Um, but yeah, unfortunately. Uh, me too. Okay. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, I need to leave for another meeting, um, which I am two minutes late already to, uh, okay. as well. I would like to thank everyone okay. um, uh, for their attendance, for their great question. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I'll be in the in the uh, other chat if anyone still wants to just talk off the record. Please join. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks.